Good morning, everybody. Happy Wednesday. We have an amazing show for everybody today. What do we have, Crystal? Indeed, we do. We've got Matt Iglesias on his first time on Rising to talk about his big new book about a one billion people in the United States. Yeah. So that'll be interesting. I'm sure we'll also ask him about the presidential race. We've got Trita Parsi on. He's going to talk about that UAE Israel peace deal. He's also going to talk about what's going on with Iran vis a vis the United States after some uh, mutual threats That's back right. and forth. Uh, but we wanted to start with the big town hall last night with President Trump. Yeah, so a huge town hall that the president did there, almost an hour there, special news on ABC primetime, and it was very interesting. A couple of questions. Frankly, the president didn't come off all that well. He had particularly bad moments whenever it came to coronavirus. Let's take a listen to those. If you believe it's the president's responsibility to protect America, why would you downplay a pandemic that is known to disproportionately harm low-income families and minority communities? Yeah. Well, I didn't downplay it. I actually, in many ways, I upplayed it in terms of action. My did you action not was very to it strong. Yourself, saying yeah, because that you... what I did was uh, with China, I put a ban on. With Europe, I put a ban on. And we would have lost thousands of more people had I not put the ban on. So that was called action, not with the mouth, but in actual fact. We did a very, very good job when we put that ban on. Whether you call it talent or luck, it was very important. So we saved a lot of lives when we did that. And we are going to be OK. We're going to be OK. And it is going away. And it's probably going to go away now a lot faster because of the vaccine. It would go away without the vaccine, George. But it's going to go away a lot faster. It would with go away without the vaccine? Sure. Over a period of time. Sure. With time. It goes and many away. deaths. And you'll develop, you'll develop herd, like a herd mentality. It's going, to be, it's going to be herd developed, and that's going to happen. That will all happen. But with the vaccine, I think it will go away very quickly. Yeah, Crystal, so we Art had developed. to... developed. Not good. And the reason we had to highlight those is a couple of things. One is you can actually see the snarky questions from the journalists you can always expect, but you can see the people are angry. Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of anger there. There was a lot of emotion questions from last those questioners. People were pissed. They were like, hey, why exactly are we having to live this way? And that kind of confirms something I've really always thought about the race, is that it is just impossible for many people to look past February and March about how the coronavirus was handled. Having people like Larry Kudlow go out there, say it was contained, have the president compare it to the flu, and then having to live, you know, in this mess for the last seven months. And we've got their two different seasons um, inside with coronavirus. That is just a, a too much. And this, again, harkens back to something that I warned about whenever he appointed that new advisor who was pushing a herd, men, a herd immune, I almost said mentality, mentality. like Trump. <laughs> I heard immunity strategy, which I knew would be a political disaster. There are reams of polling that you can look at, which say that if you ask Americans, would you rather that we save the economy and make sure that coronavirus becomes more widespread, leading to death, and eventually things would be okay, or would you rather suffer? Um, it's like suffer through lockdown, even though Congress has proven at this point that they will not pass more economic relief. Overwhelmingly, three-fourths of American citizens say, no, I'll take the latter option. And you can see that. We're going to cover later in the show about how the governors have handled this whole situation, where their approval ratings stand. Americans' choice is clear. They do not want to go through some herd immunity strategy. Yeah. They want somebody to take it seriously. And so whenever he's like, well, I took it seriously through action, not necessarily through the mouth, it was, it was very, it was stumbling, and it really just did not have a core reassurance to Americans. Yes, I'm going to take it more seriously as time goes on. And when the only thing you can point to is the China ban, which, yes, look, you were yeah, right, great. To, right to do at the time, but when that's the only thing you can point to, and it feels kind of disconnected and removed mm -hmm. from the day-to-day -day concerns that people have, it's not a very strong case. And here's the other thing. Look, President Trump is a world-class bullshitter. Like, he's incredible at it. It's the reason that he's the president of the United States. And you watch him last night, you, like, marvel at his ability just to, like, invent and create out of thin air a narrative that suits his purposes. But on this thing, you can't bullshit people because yeah. we were all there. We lived it. Like, you can't gaslight people on this thing in the same way that he's been able to, frankly, on so many other issues. And especially not when we have his words on tape saying, I wanted to downplay it. I still want to downplay it. So when he turns around and says, oh, no, I didn't do that. I didn't downplay it. In many ways, I upplayed it. Yeah. It's absurd. It's ridiculous. We heard you saying the exact opposite thing. And whenever it's about something, 
something like Stormy Daniels or whatever. People don't care, right? They're like, this yes, doesn't impact my that's life. That's it too. Oh, but this does impact your life. You're like, hey, wait a second. I was there. Remember the ratings from some of those early press conferences, the coronavirus task force briefings? They were through the roof. I mean, tens of millions of Americans were watching those or they're watching snippets of it, digesting news. News coverage at the time of March and April was the highest in, in modern American history. We're basically showing you that people were hungry for what is happening? What do I need to know? How should I be living my life? These are things that you just cannot escape. Right. And so when two thirds of Americans disapprove already of the way that you've handled the coronavirus and you don't have a reassuring answer, not just on the Woodward book, this is kind of what I think we both said whenever the Woodward book came out, we were like, it's not necessarily the tapes. It's just, you're getting reminded of what the hell happened in February and March. And it also strikes me here that he just has not really, was not internalized what that internal polling data really means. And it kind of reminds me of Barack Obama whenever he was running for re-election in 2012. He could not get it through its head until the, near the end of, his, of, the, of the race that actually the state of the country was not good. As in, he kept running and talking as if America was saved from the economic recovery. Why aren't you Americans like kissing my feet for making sure that we have like 8% unemployment now, even though we used to have 10% unemployment? And that Mitt Romney could have run a campaign which hit him much more on the economic response. It was only in the very latter parts of the campaign, despite the fact that Obama's campaign was saying something different, that Obama himself internalized. He's like, hey, wait, people are really suffering and I need to speak to that more. Yeah, and on that point, so not only was there, look, the number one issue for voters is coronavirus. Yeah, I think that is like what 30%. is going to be determinative. And it's part of why there are so few undecided voters, why in spite of all the things that we've seen play out, why the polls have moved ultimately very little. But the second concern for voters is the economic front, the failure of a stimulus in Washington, the inability of this president and congressional leaders to actually pass another stimulus to help small businesses, to help state and local governments, to help individual families be able to make it through what has been a very difficult time for much of the country. And so, I mean, sort of cartoonishly, he went all in on the stock market is what really matters. Let's take a listen to that. There's a lot of people look at this and say it's more like a K-shaped recovery. The people at the top who have a lot of stocks are, are, are doing pretty well. But you've only gotten that... half the jobs back. George, stocks are owned by everybody. I mean, you know, if they talk about the stock market is so good. That's 401ks. I'm meeting people with, as long as they didn't sell when the market went down, when we first realized the you know extent of this horrible thing from China, I mean, these people are doing, some of them are doing better than they were doing before the pandemic came. So that 13. If they, if people million held on to their stocks, and remember this, because I notice you say wealthy, sure, wealthy, but you have people that aren't wealthy, but have done well because of the stock market. All right, so a couple of facts That's here. That's not true. First right. of all, 85% of stocks are owned by 10%. The 10% wealthiest Americans own 85% of stocks. So just on the facts, it's completely wrong right. and disconnected from the reality that Americans are living. And we've covered the data here. It is a K-shaped recovery. Yeah, the people in like the top 20%, the folks who are working from home, who've kind of cut back on expenses, they maybe benefit a little bit from the first stimulus, they're doing fine, they're doing just great. But it's that bottom 50% of the country who lost their jobs or they've been put at risk with no hazard pay, who are wondering how they're gonna make rent, who are wondering how they're gonna feed their families, those are the people who are struggling and been completely invisible to everyone in Washington and, by the way, are not benefiting from your stock market hike. That's the real, I mean, I, it's, it blows me away to hear him talk this way. And I just know what the BS that Cudlow and these people are feeding him. Be like, oh, Mr. President, 55% of people own stocks, like you just said. Well, 85% of them are held by the top 10. A lot of the way that people own stock is through like, like retirement packages which they don't necessarily have uh, ownership over or through some sort of pension plan. So it's not the way that you might think. And even then, talking about people who have 401ks is like not the majority of the country. And I would actually bet, I would venture to guess that if you were to poll people with the 401k, they are overwhelmingly more likely to support Biden than they are to support Very Trump. Very fair point. And so even then, if you really want to talk to the people who voted for you and who put you in the Oval Office who don't have college degrees, we're talking about 
about non-secondary education households who own stocks, that number is like 20 or 30 percent. So look, it's so clear what is happening right now. The poverty rate here actually rose since the end of the unemployment rate. It's like 10.8%, something like that. Amongst black Americans, it's 22%. Amongst Latinos, it's something like 17%. So yeah. again, we have a rising poverty rate. Yes, the top 20% of American workers are doing better. But even these, you know, not I wouldn't call them PMCs, whatever the, you know, 40 to 20% bracket, they're not doing that all that great either. Yeah. They lost 10% of their wealth. So 80% of the country has at least lost some portion of their wealth. You need to speak more to that. And there is just nothing there. And from Biden, there's a, I mean, there's not that much, but there's a little bit. And people are going to grasp for straws in a zero-sum election. Well, and he's not in charge. I mean, yeah. they're placing the blame, rightfully so, at Trump's feet and hoping that Biden is going to do a little bit better. And Biden, I would say since the DNC, they've shifted a little bit of their rhetoric to focus a bit more on the economy. But ultimately, Trump is in charge. As we both know, if he came to the table and he forced Republicans to back a real stimulus right. package, they would fall in line. And the fact that Pelosi is out there like, please let me spend two and a half trillion Trillion dollars to help you get reelected, and he's like, no, is insane. There was actually another part of this that was kind of a clue, a little bit more of a clue into why he hasn't more aggressively pushed for stimulus and why he's been so opposed mm -hmm. to de Democratic proposals. He got asked about, you know, you talk about like Democratic states and Democratic cities. Don't you see yourself as a president of everyone? He went really deep into like, no, these are democratic states right. and I don't want to bail them out. And it exposed a piece of his thinking, like basically out of spite, he doesn't want to go along with a package that would bail out state and local governments, even though, yes, yeah, some of them are blue states. Some of them are not blue states. Ask Kentucky, like they need help too. There are a lot of states out there that are not blue states, not democratic run that need this help as well. But I think that is an actually important piece of his mentality around why he's been so resistant to going forward with this is a stimulus. deep Republican thing, which is they hate Democrats so much that they don't realize that actually if you bailed them out, you know, you could actually increase your overall approval rating. But one of the things that they look at, they love to do this whole Democrat run cities are in chaos like Portland and Seattle and all. And look, I mean, a lot of it is true, but more what it is, is that just because they're Democrat run does not mean they're not American cities. You're still the president, which is that you need to look at it as like, no, I still have jurisdiction over this place. Yeah, even though overwhelmingly the citizens there don't like me. That's what the federal government is literally supposed to be. And so I think it plays very much into this type of vindictive mentality of like, oh no, like we hate these people, so why bail them out? Whereas if you have a unifying message of no, we're all in this together through no fault of their own, are you bankrupt? We're yeah. all bankrupt. That's how it is. We'll bail everybody out, you actually could build a large governing coalition. That's actually how you get people to come on your side while putting partisanship aside in the worst of a crisis. But that's what they decided not There's to. There's a corollary to that on the Democratic side. You see a lot of times people talking about like, oh, well, the, the red states, the southern states in particular, like freeloaders, we're yeah, subsidizing right. them in the blue right. states. And I mean, one thing that I just fundamentally reject is this picking and choosing which Americans are worthy yeah. of like a decent life and living in a safe and decent place. And that mentality from Trump I found really disgusting. The last thing that we should say is that the Biden campaign was apparently unable to come with, up with yeah. a mutually agreeable time to also sit down with Stephanopoulos, Stephanopoulos and ABC News. Biden will be doing a town hall on CNN right. tomorrow night, though. I'm sure we'll bring you the highlights of that yeah. as well. But pretty interesting, very revealing night, I would say, in terms of the president's mentality, ultimately. I didn't think he did a very good job, but look, at least he's going and answering questions out there. Well, so, there's you know. that. So we have things to talk about here. <laughs> All right, we're going to tell you what's on our radars. That's next.